global scale summit uh, on the key skills first, unlocking the opportunities for all. Uh, please welcome our dignitaries, Mr. Amit Kalyani, Kiki uh, Chair, HR and Skills Committee, and Vice Chairman and Joint Managing Director of Bharat Force Genesis, uh, Sri Ashwarya, Chairman JBM Group, Mr. Ashim Fawcett, Country Managing Director, Lord in India, Ms. Madhu Shavastra, Co-Chair, Chitti HR and Skills Committee and CHRO Vedanta, and Mr. Manan Majinda, Senior Advisor, Kiki. I would also want to extend a warm welcome to the dignitaries, government officials, partners, speakers, senior leaders from the Kiwet ecosystem to this very significant and important conference that we are doing today. To formally start the session, I would request Mr. Manam Majumda, a senior advisor, Kiki, to welcome Mr. Amit Kalyani, chair of the HR and Skills Committee and Vice Chairman and Joint Managing Director with a green certificate, please. Through this initiative, we pledge planting of trees at the periphery of a wide country. Also, Ms. Adho Srivastava, co-chair of the HR and Skills Committee, Group to HR Road, Kodansa, President of the Committee. Thank you. Like I said, this is the 15th year of the uh, Kiki Global Skills Summit and we embark on this journey with a vision to create a platform for thought leadership, innovation, networking, within stakeholders, in the skill and innovation ecosystem and get all the policy makers for the thought leaders and academic okay. leaders come to a forum and look at this whole conference as a forum where we deliberate upon the roadmap that we want to see in the sector going ahead and the kind of best practices that are happening in the space of skilling and TV ecosystem is what the intent and of this conference has been and uh, we from time to time only going a step forward in trying to look at the whole space in a way, uh, in, a, in a format so that they able to bring the right kind of uh, you know, a format for stakeholders to look into and emulate going forward and with that perspective, you know, this conference is only kind of, you know, augmenting the quality, scale and magnitude. Uh, this year, of course, we have a very important knowledge report that would get released in the course of time. And to formally again start this proceeding of this inaugural session that we have today, I request Mr. Madhav Achunda, uh, Senior Advisor Vicky, to uh, welcome you all with his, with his address. Thank you, Rajesh. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Mr. Amit Kellan, Chair, PTHR and Skills Committee, and Vice Chairman and Joint MD, World Forum. Mr. S. K. Arya, Chairman, JBM Group. Mr. Asim Kaushik, Country Managing Director, Lord Hill, India. Ms. Madhu Srivastav, Co-Chair, PTHR and Skills Committee, and CHRO, Vedanta Resources. Distributed dignitaries of the layers, esteemed speakers, leaders from industry, academia, friends from media, our valued partners, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to welcome you all at the 15th Global Skill Summit 2024 organized by the The theme for this year. Skills first, unlocking opportunities for all is not just a slogan, it's a call to action. A call 
that asks us to reflect on how we could view the role of skills in society and the economy. Skills, as all of you know, are the very foundation on which we build the future of individuals, industries, in the entire nation. In the current global scenario, there is a detriment, a rapid technological transformation and unprecedented shift in the job market still have taken the center stage. It's no longer enough to think of education and skill as separate compartments, separate entities. They are part of the same continuum. And it is this integration that will drive our success or the lack of Ladies and gentlemen, Piki Skill Development Vertical has been working with the stakeholders over the years. Partnerships are forged and solutions are crafted. The next two days during this summit, I'm confident to witness significant deliberations and sharing of best practices on some of the critical areas of the skilling ecosystem. With such distinct kind of speakers in the opening session and the session that will follow, I am sure this summit is going to be a great success. I encourage all of you kindly take this opportunity to engage in meaningful dialogue, share your insights, and most importantly, collaborate on solutions that will empower our people and unlock the vast potential that lies within them. In these words, I would like to welcome you all once again. Thank you for your kind attention, gentlemen. Thank you. Namaskar. Jai. Thank you, sir. Uh, I can't trust the Tamil Kalyan, Chairman uh, of the Academy of the Tamil Kalyan, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Bharat Sports, the General Assembly of the Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Unfortunately, we are, uh, our uh, minister is called away at some important event. Uh, we miss his presence, but we are happy for the support and guidance that we get from the ministry. I'd like to welcome Mr. Arya, Mr. Kaushik, Ms. Uh, Mandu Srivastava, and Mr. Mala Pujunda. Uh, distinguished dignitaries, senior government officials, speakers, leaders from industry, academia, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is my distinct honor to address you at the 15th Fiki Global Summit on the theme of Skills First, Unlocking Opportunities for All. This summit has been a significant platform that has over the years shaped the national dialogue on skill development. Today, skills are the currency for both personal and national progress. In the face of rapid technological disruption and shifting workforce dynamics, the role of skilling has never been more central to our nation's future economically. On a global scale, we are witnessing an ever-widening skill gap that is becoming a barrier to growth for most countries around the world. According to the WEF, by 2030, more than 85 million jobs could be displaced by automation and AI by 2025. But close to 100 million new ones may emerge that are better suited to new division of labor, especially young people. Globally, the economies are facing a paradox where we have millions of job openings, but not the right kind of talent or not the talent to meet those jobs. In fact, 55% of employees globally will require significant upskilling by just by next year, 2025, to remain relevant in their current roles. And let me explain what I mean by this. If we take our sector, which is manufacturing, which is probably one of the largest employment generators and multipliers of employment, 
the role of an employee in manufacturing is going from manual to process management to knowledge management, which means they have to understand the human machine interface, what knowledge or inputs the machine is seeking from the individual and knowledge to provide that uh, input to the machine in a short period of time in the right manner. It's a collaboration between human machine that has not taken place before because we have never been working in real time together. Here in India also the situation is quite critical but a little different. In India, we have probably one of the largest opportunities for job creation, especially with migration of uh, certain industries from the China plus one, plus from west to east because of non-competitiveness of certain uh, manufacturing areas and sectors. However, a large percentage of our manpower, which is below the age of 35, is still currently either unemployed or unemployed. And the reason is that our education sector does not provide the kind of skills and knowledge that makes a person employed. Typically, and you've seen this in the IT sector also, you hire right people and then you have to put them through one year or so of retraining or I would say reset training to make them really productive and employed. Now, the goal of a uh, skills council like this which is to give and make policy ideas is to bridge that gap so that people can come out of education straight into an employable workforce. We believe that currently more than 75% of our youth will need to be reskilled, upskilled to meet the demands of modern industry including industry 4.0. While the task ahead is monumental, India is a large country with many hands and shoulders available to bear this task. As per the ILO report in 2024, global unemployment rate is 5.8%, while the youth unemployment rate stands at about 14%. There is significant variation across certain countries. The unemployment rate in India for youth aged 15 to 29 is approximately 20%. Now, this is a very scary statistic. Unless we are able to find a way to bring this down rapidly in the next four or five years, we will have a lot of other problems to fix. These two indicators of youth and employment clearly demonstrate the need for rapid and large scale skilling and reskilling of our youth. The National Skill Development Council estimates that India will require an additional 120 million skilled workers by 2030 to cater to sectors like manufacturing, healthcare, renewable energy, digital technologies, etc. But please note that skilling is not just about education. It's also about creating the right mindset, the right attitude, the right understanding of what it means to work in an organized workforce. How to drive productivity, how to be innovative, and work as a team to contribute to success of your enterprise and industry. Another pressing issue is workforce participation. According to the latest data, India's labor force participation rate remains relatively low, especially compared to global averages. Globally, the average is 61%, in India is 49%. There are countries which have this number in excess of 70%. So, uh, what is particularly concerning is the significantly low participation of women in the workforce, which is at 24%, which is almost half the global average of 47%. It's very clear that as a country we can't make progress if we only focus on 50% of the total population. We have to get and increase dramatically the, the amount of young women, ladies, actively participating in the workforce. And we have to have many different avenues to make this happen. It can't be only formal work. It also has to be ability for them to work from home in order to make sure that they are able to balance other requirements that they have in their lives. 
So to address this, we need to focus on not only equipping women with skills, but create this enabling environment. The need for a comprehensive data-driven approach to skilling cannot be understated. Recent studies indicate that while India has made strides in vocational training and skilling initiatives, the impact is uneven across regions and sectors. For instance, skilling initiatives in IT, manufacturing, and healthcare have shown promising results, while those in agriculture construction are still significantly lagging behind and far from adopting modern skilling techniques. And this is again because these are largely unorganized sectors rather than organized sectors where there is a more structured approach to making skilling happen. Data from the World Bank and ILO highlight a crucial trend. Countries that invest in targeting skilling initiatives see significantly higher levels of employment, improved economic stability, greater resilience to economic shocks, so very clear that in India we must enhance the capacity of our skilling ecosystem to align with both domestic and global benchmarks. This requires robust partnership between government, industry, academia, and various other social sector bodies to design and implement <coughs> skilling initiatives that are future proof. Fiki, with its deep connections to both industry and government, is in a unique position catalyze this change and I am confident that through the continued collaboration we can build a robust future ready workforce. The National Education Policy 2020 has laid a strong foundation by emphasizing the integration of vocational education and mainstream education. This has been one large missing link in our education system which unlike some western countries <coughs> is a book learning model rather than a mixed learning model which allows and I believe this is very important that it is not going to be required in the future for everybody to go to college directly after class 12. I honestly believe that you will have an opportunity to try out various jobs and then once you find what, is it, what it is that interests you, while working you can also pursue higher learning and higher knowledge in that so that you can progress uh, in that area. It will also help uh, reduce the burden of the amount of money that is spent on education without having productive employment after that. So I think this model will evolve and change and we need to support this. So a lot of schemes of the government like need, like the intern program, internship programs are there which allow you to hire people once they finish class 12 and they can work for three years, learn what they like, what they don't like and then can go back to college. I think this is going to be a very important element as well. So while there has been a strong foundation laid by the NEP, uh, much more needs to be done to ensure that the policies translate into real world outcomes and we need to ensure especially that the youth in tier 2, tier 3 cities have access to the same quality of skilling as those in metropolitan areas. And now with you know, e-learning etc, this is possible to do the government, ITIs are now open to uh, private sector to adopt, take over and implement training through them. So I think these are all methodologies that are helping the outreach and the outcomes uh, through distributed learning across India. Globally we see that nations are thriving, uh, that are thriving are those that have prioritized a skilled workforce. Uh, from Europe's dual education model to Singapore's emphasis on continuous lifelong learning, the world's leading economies have understood that a skills first approach is not just an option but a reality. While the government has introduced numerous initiatives such as Skill India, the Apprentice Promotion Scheme, and the various employment link incentive schemes, the success of this program depends on how effectively they are implemented at the ground level. I must highlight here that the industry has played a major role and has a major role to play in effective execution of such critical schemes. Corporates must take a more proactive role in skilling and reskilling their workforce. <coughs> Public private partnership to foster today will determine the workforce of tomorrow. For India to achieve its vision of becoming a developed economy, we must adopt this model, and I am proud to say that we are making great strides in this direction. I am sure that the sessions that follow today and tomorrow will showcase some of the most innovative models of collaboration between industry, academia, and government, and these success stories can become blueprints for building a skill, skilling landscape for the future. I am happy to share that we will be releasing the FIKI EY report 2024 and Future of Jobs 3.0 in a short while from now. This report summarizes the changing landscape of jobs and skills 
in five important sectors, manufacturing, infrastructure, energy, healthcare, and FMCG, and looks ahead towards the challenges we face, be it climate change, digital disruption, or workforce mobility. Our commitment to fostering sustainable practices and inclusive growth have never been more crucial. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that skills first is not just a theme for this summit, it must become the driving principle for our national agenda. The future of work is already upon us, and the choices we make today will shape the India of the future. Let us commit to building a skills ecosystem that is inclusive, future-focused, and capable of unlocking opportunities for all. Finally, on a more optimistic note, let me say that in India, we see tremendous growth opportunities across the board for every sector. For two reasons, as I mentioned earlier, movement of uh, demand and manufacturing and requirements from China plus one plus west to India, plus the India growth story, which is going to require huge consumption growth, or which is going to demand huge consumption growth, leading to increase in the formal sectors of manufacturing and uh, allied infrastructure sectors. So this can be the base on which we can build our skilling and talent model going forward. I would urge all stakeholders, government, industry, academia to come together in the spirit of collaboration. And our friends in the media, I think you have a huge role to play in giving a positive message, impetus, and encouragement to these initiatives in order to make sure that people are aware of what the opportunities are and what is available to them in order to take advantage of those opportunities in improving their own livelihoods. Let us leverage this summit to share ideas, form partnerships, and create actionable solutions that will ensure that India's workforce is not just prepared for the challenges today, but is ready to lead the world into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kalyani, for that enriching insight and setting the context for the previous delegation that we have. It's been a real pleasure working on this and that we must create this whole activity. So I would now request uh, Mr. Haseen Koshik, the Managing Director of Law in India, to deliver this session of Good morning everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my warmest uh, greetings to the Pavilion and Father Kalyan, in front of Kalyan. I would like to enjoy my name as the Chair of the Pavilion School of Law School of Law School of I would also like to extend my deepest uh, gratitude to uh, the Ministry of Skill Development. partners today to uh, move forward the skilling program of the government of India uh, forward. So while we will be talking about the EY report which will be coming in and there are various sectors I was you know, asking in the morning the EY team which they will be talking about, I would want to talk to you about the FMCG So, and why would we skill a very important part of the FMCG sector. And uh, incidentally, just to start with, L'Oreal, which is a French multinational, is the number one beauty company in the world. Came into India exactly about 30 years ago. And it has been uh, a, a real uh, endeavor for us for the last 27 years to build one of our businesses based on only skill and enhancement of uh, skills in one of the divisions which we today have where we sell products to salons. And uh, the story goes uh, as following. So if you all remember about 27 years ago, if you went out to get a haircut or to get something uh, in the salon, there were two kinds of salons which were uh, present. All men actually went to barbers. Uh, they got a quick haircut. And maybe if they were lucky, they would get an oil massage. And all women actually went to women's only beauty parlors. So, and there were no modern unisex salons in India at that time. And in 1997, 
when we were trying to bring in our professional products, which are products which are used inside the salons, uh, unfortunately there were no salons existing anymore. So this was the time we started to figure out, if we have to do business, what do we do? So in 1997, we invested ahead of curve on infrastructure to really train addressers from scratch. So today what we have is uh, close to 46 centers uh, which exist, a uh, trained force of about 200 trainers which work full time for L'Oreal. Uh, we train close to uh, 350,000 hairdressers every year. And what it has done over the years, and we actually managed to train almost 33 lakh hairdressing contacts. Because when you're looking at skill development, uh, skill development is not about teaching for two days or three days. And when we are looking at it from a perspective of uh, hairdressing, which is an artisanal skill where people are working with their hands, etc., etc. Uh, the number of times you need to skill them and re-skill them and develop them becomes very, very important. So in the last 27 years, where we have been able to train 33 lakh hairdressing contacts in India. What it has done, <coughs> what it has done is, uh, and I still remember, uh, you know, 27 years ago, when there were no equipments in salons, the salons had a, uh, you know, Parta, uh, as we say it, or a curtain where people could not <coughs> see from outside what was happening inside, etc. And I want to tell you a story of exactly that time because a lot of you are from Delhi. And you would have seen a chain of salon uh, called Gitanji. Yeah? And this was a time when Gitanji was actually a very small beauty parlor run by a lady in Green Park. And, and we met her, and we met her son, who was 15 years old. And we put this son to go through a lot of trainings, not only in India, through our L'Oreal program. Because uh, in the end, in India, there was not even a structured hairdressing school that time. So we created almost 19 hairdressing schools in India with our partners, with a very robust curriculum of six months, where you get in uh, as a young uh, student, and you can actually become a hairdresser in six months' time. And this gentleman, who was a young chap then, uh, came eventually was sent by L'Oreal to the UK to do two months of course there and brought back. The scaling is, uh, and he started to work to kind of start a new, very modern looking beauty sex salon in Green Park. And it was called the Gitanjali L'Oreal Collaboration Salon. So, and, and this was a salon which was for the first time for had men and women sitting together. There was, uh, there was a big uh, glass uh, window outside where people could see people <coughs> inside what was happening. And this was actually the beginning of the modern unisex salon industry in India. So skilling can be about artisanal skilling, it can be about teaching how to use products, it can be about uh, teaching how to uh, create some services inside your uh, salon. But from there, I think what is important is to teach business skills as well. There's and, it, and taking the same example of uh, Sumit from Gitanjali, we've helped him over the 27 years to set up a robust chain of 175 <coughs> salons where he employs close to 1,000 people in his salons who are working full time. So you can imagine today the network that we have been able to create is about 50,000 salons in India, uh, which are uh, in, spread over almost 600 cities employing close to 300,000 uh, people, where their income levels have actually increased five-fold times <coughs> over the last 10 years. And this you would witness, I'm sure you guys have been witnessing when you go to the salon, it is a very different looking salon from there. So coming back to the, to the overall story of saying, is this enough? I think the two tenants on scaling are very, very important for us to consider. One, as Amit also mentioned, inclusivity. You know, uh, the fact is that women participation is is an absolute, absolute uh, must which we need to make sure whenever we are kind of looking at any of our endeavors and policy making on skill development. Today, if you look at the 50,000 salons I'm talking to you about. 35,000 salons from there are actually led and run by women entrepreneurs. So this is a small, medium uh, sector, micro kind of uh, social entrepreneurial venture, if you want to call it, that people want to start. 
and this can actually become huge in India. The second bit, of course, is clearly on uh, taking this forward from an inclusivity perspective is the underprivileged part of the society which needs to be brought into mainstream. So from our CSR activities in, in Montreal, uh, we are committed to actually train uh, into our CSR programs 100,000 hairdressers in the next uh, five years uh, through a program called Beauty for Better Life. The second part which we cannot miss, and I'm talking now in a scaling angle, is the whole India digital vibrant economy which is based on this amazing tech stack which has been created and the opportunity which gives, gives that for all micro-entrepreneurs to leverage. And when you're looking at that, how do you leverage this digitally connected society to make sure that you can actually leverage it for furthering your business, increasing your business, developing your business? So I leave you with a thought where uh, today uh, L'Oreal has actually helped in the last uh, one year 100,000 hairdressers to open up their Facebook, Instagram accounts, etc. Uh, with the help of uh, the, uh, with the help of Google and Meta, to train them how to become micro influencers. I'm sure today, when you're opening your feed on Instagram or on YouTube or on Facebook, you must be getting uh, targeted by somebody who is doing a before and after, and who's a hairdresser who shows you a before of uh, hair and an after of hair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is not happening by chance. Uh, a lot of skill development, a lot of entrepreneurship, and a lot of uh, education is going behind that. So for me, uh, these two aspects form uh, the bedrock for uh, any scaling uh, decisions which you will make today as industry, as industry bodies, as, as government. And the third part of it is uh, connectivity. Connecting the skilled people to where the opportunity of employment is available. I think that part today is missing. Because do we have a platform where all industry requirements are uh, out there in a very clean way, followed by the industry to, uh, to leverage, to say, here is an exchange uh, for services, because I'm talking about services business right now. And services apparently is 60% of our GDP, which is growing in the between 2 percent So here is the requirement for the industry for uh, services, for uh, you know manufacturing, for, for IT, etc. with the company is very specific. So this is not something which is very, very organized in structure. For me, there is a requirement of something like this which we should think of and work towards. And uh, in the end, I would like to say that uh, we are very proud to partner uh, the Fifty Skilling uh, Committee, and uh, we want to thank them for the opportunity to work very closely with you guys to, uh, to, to take the skilling program in India uh, to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaushik, for, for this question. Uh, I would now request uh, Mr. S.K. Arya, Chairman. Good morning. My colleagues on the dais, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Namaste. It's a pleasure to address this distinguished gathering at Pikki's Global Skills Summit. Today, we converse around a theme that resonates deeply with the times we live in. Skills first, unlocking opportunities for all. The era we find ourselves in is one defined by disruption and reinvention. Technology is no longer just an enabler, it is the core architect of the new world order. Automation, artificial intelligence, and the digital economy are rewriting the rules of the game. As the boundaries of industries blur, we must urgently recalibrate the way we think about the future of work and the future of skills. 
this is not just a matter of responding to change, it's about leading it. As a country and indeed as a global community, we are on the threshold of profound transition. The very foundation of work, productivity and employment is shifting beneath our feet. And if we are to thrive in this new world, our response must be as bold and dynamic as the forces shaping it. Over the years, I have witnessed firsthand how the demand for skills has evolved, not only in manufacturing, but across industries. Industry 4.0, also called the fourth industrial revolution, is here driven by disruptive trends, including the rise of data and connectivity. Analytics, human-machine interaction, and improvements in robotics. Its impact is transforming businesses and economies at an unprecedented scale. However, the success of this revolution depends largely on the readiness of our workforce. At JBM Group, we have made skills a central pillar of our strategy. We believe that nurturing talent and enabling continuous learning and the bedrock for the unlocking growth and innovation. Through focused skill development initiatives, we have empowered thousands of youth, creating a dynamic environment where creativity and problem solving are nurtured. Yet, the responsibility of skilling goes beyond individual businesses as industry leaders, government bodies, and academic institutions, we must work hand in hand to establish robust ecosystems that prioritize skills as a key driver of economic empowerment. The key, however, lies in our ability to future-proof skills. Upskilling and reskilling must become embedded in the culture of businesses as technology and market demands continue to evolve. By embarrassing continuous learning, we enable individuals at the levels to transition smoothly into new roles, ensuring no one is left behind. I would like to highlight a few essential areas that can further accelerate our journey towards a skill-first economy. Number one, collaboration between industry and academia. We must further evolve the curriculum and training programs that align more closely with the current and future needs of various industries. Internships, apprenticeships, and hands-on training programs should be a part of every learner's journey. For example, the rise of data scientists, AI engineers, and cybersecurity experts demonstrates the need for specialized skills in these areas. Number two, leveraging digital platforms. With the advent of technology, e-learning and digital platforms offer unprecedented across to skill development. We must ensure that digital literacy is prioritized and that learning is democratized for everyone regardless of geographic location or socioeconomic status. Number three, encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship. By fostering a mindset of innovation and entrepreneurship, we can empower the workforce not only to seek opportunities, but to create them. The skilled individuals must be encouraged to experiment, innovate, and challenge the status quo. Number four, inclusion, inclusion and diversity in skilling. Finally, we must ensure that our skill development initiatives are inclusive and equitable. Women, especially able individuals and underrepresented communities should have equal access to opportunities that can shape their futures. India, a burgeoning economic power, aspires to become the global hub for skilled manpower. 
to capitalize on its demographic dividend and transform into the world's manufacturing capital. India must prioritize skill development across all sectors, industry, academia, and government. While the recent World Skills Leon 2024 results with four bronze medals and 12 medallions for excellence are increasing. They highlight the need for significant improvements in our strategy and efforts. By placing skills at the forefront of our strategic initiatives, we can narrow the gap with countries like China, Korea, Taiwan, Japan. History demonstrates a strong correlation between strong skills and the industrial output. Therefore, the progress of industry and skill development are inextricably linked. To conclude the future of businesses and indeed our economies, indeed our economies hinges on the foundation of skills. If we are to unlock the true potential of this fourth industrial revolution, we must adopt a skill-first approach, ensuring that every individual has the tools, the resources, and the opportunities to thrive in the future of work. Let's take bold steps together to create a future where opportunities are not limited by geography, gender, or background, but only by one's ability to learn, adapt, and innovate. In doing so, we will not only build resilient businesses and industries, but also inclusive and prosperous societies. Thank you. Jai Hind. We will now uh, have the formal release of uh, the uh, future of jobs in uh, And to do that, uh, you know, I would also request uh, Mr. Sura Kumar and Dr. Patna Yuvat, and also Dr. 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 Director, to uh, join us on the day. Ladies and gentlemen, industry leaders, distinguished guests and officials from the industry, a very good morning to everybody. I, it gives me an immense pleasure to address this audience today at the 15th FITI Global Skills Summit. As the co-chair of FITI's committee for HR and skills, I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our Honorable Minister, who unfortunately could not join us this morning, but I believe he may join us later today or tomorrow. I also thank the officials of the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship and National Skill Development Corporation. I would also like to thank our distinguished keynote speakers, Mr. S.K. Arya, Mr. Asim Kaushik, Mr. Kalyani, as well as Mr. Majumdar. 
whose insights on the evolving landscape of skills and employment have inspired us all and provided invaluable perspectives on the challenges and opportunities ahead. I also take this opportunity to thank the partners, sponsors, and exhibitors of the summit whose valuable contributions have given the summit its current shape. I wish to give a special mention to the artisans who have uh, continued to showcase their work through our Virasat initiative and are a part of this exhibition today. And I encourage all of you to please have a look at the exhibition and spend some time there. And also we extend heartfelt thanks to Dea Foundation who will be offering the career guidance and counseling workshop tomorrow for about 200 plus students from ITI and other colleges. Last but not the least, the audience of the summit. All of you who add the most value to the success of the summit. We are truly grateful for your participation and presence today and look forward to continuing the participation today later and as well as tomorrow. Thank you very much and have a great day. We come to a formal close of the inaugural session of the Jyoti Institute Summit. Of course, it's great for uh, networking teams. I would request you all to join us at 11.30, uh, uh, where we start off with a special address by Professor Anil Sassu, who is the anniversary of the NET of National Education Department. Thank you. Thank you so much. A sustainable world is no longer